Okay, so I'm going to be talking about Refine, as I just mentioned, and this is the uh, part of the application development lifecycle where you're iterating on the application experience and making it be a much better user experience for users. And we're going to talk specifically about best practices to keep in mind during these, this, these phases of the application development lifecycle. So I'm going to start with some background and context. And in that part, I'm going to show you an example of an application that is not necessarily well designed, has some really great functionality. And then we'll talk specifically and high, at the high level and briefly about what makes for a well designed application, Windows Phone application. Then I'll dive right into the best practices. I'm going to talk about 10, which is quite a lot, so I'm going to try to spend most of my time there. And I'm going to use a real application in a not so well designed state, apply those best practices in Visual Studio and Blend, primarily Blend, to end up with a very well designed application in the end. So it should be a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and get started. And with respect to background and context, again, I'm going to show you an application not necessarily well designed at this particular point, and I'm not picking on this application. There are many well, not well designed applications out in the marketplace for various phone uh, platforms. Um, this doesn't mean they don't have great functionality. It just means that there are simply some things the developer or designer may want to circle back on during these iteration aspects of the development lifecycle to improve the user experience. Um, so we'll talk about a few examples here. And we'll do this in, because my demo app is not working, I'm going to show you the experience in expression design. Has anybody in the audience used expression design? Oh, good. Awesome. Um, so it is very similar to Illustrator, for those of you who are not familiar with it. And let me give a little bit of background on the application that we're going to look at. So these are some of the screens from this particular application. It's called Meal Nirvana. It's got a lot of amazing functionality. I actually really like it. So what it does is it uses GPS to locate where you currently are, and then it takes a set of criteria that you've identified for restaurants that you particularly like, and it will recommend restaurants in the current location that you're currently at. It also allows you to track, track your restaurant expenditures, and it has a nice additional feature where it can help you calculate the tip. So really great functionality. Again, there are some user experience issues that I want to talk about very briefly here, starting with the application tile. So I'm going to zoom in. And this is the application tile that I have my cursor over right now. And it's, it's nice, but it's really not well defined. It's kind of hard to make out the details of this particular application icon. You can't read the text. So clearly, that's a problem. Unlike with Twitter and our Maps application, one of our native applications, or our Outlook application, or even Facebook, it's very easy to see the icon. It's very easy to recognize which application you might want to interact with and open on the start page here. So something that this particular application developer might want to circle back on and address is their application tile to make it more readable. And even more in line with the tiles that you're seeing elsewhere in our native applications and even the third party applications. The next thing let's take a look at is the loading screen that we're seeing here. So it's, it's definitely a cute image. Um, it's something, though, that it doesn't really, the style is not really in line with the Metro design language. Uh, so they might want to actually simplify this particular loading animation. So just another example of something to circle back on. And let's look at the opening screen in the application as well, the opening experience. So first of all, you'll notice the background image doesn't really speak to great restaurant experiences. I'm really not quite sure what this background image is. I'm sure you're kind of wondering the same. Another thing I want to call attention to are the fonts. There are two different fonts that you're seeing on this screen here. The top is the Windows, uh, the Sago WP, Windows Phone Sago font, which you get by default when you're using the panorama uh, 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 control, which is what we're seeing here. 
And then, they're, then they chose Comic Sans for the main body of information. And those two fonts don't really work well together. Um, so they, they probably want to be a bit more cohesive and choose a better font for the body of information, maybe even something a little bit more readable. The next thing I'll point out are alignment issues. And I have my cursor over this information where we're seeing Yelp. This is very, uh, very slight misalignment here. But misalignments or random alignment of elements can actually harm the usability and the overall aesthetic of an application experience. You may not recognize it right away, but under the covers, you're probably a little bit agitated by something that's out of a line. Definitely something to pay attention to in an application experience. So let's go a little bit deeper into our tip calculator. So this is deeper in the application. Um, one of the things I want to talk about here is they're using a panorama at a deeper level in this application experience. Panoramas are typically found at the higher level. Again, they're, uh, think, magazine cover. Um, they really tease the user in deep, to dig deeper into the application experience. At this level, we would recommend some other uh, application pattern, maybe a pivot. It's more appropriate. Again, the fonts are a little, uh, you know, uh, they're just not working well together, as well as the graphic style that you're seeing here. Um, and one last thing before we move on, these buttons down here, they're standard buttons, and we actually have a button style. If you were to drag and drop in Visual Studio or in Expression Blend, a button onto the design surface, it's a very consistent style. So we would recommend that they either leverage that style or maybe use Application Bar for the command buttons. Just be a little bit more consistent with what you see elsewhere in our native applications, and as, as well as in third-party applications. So brief introduction or a little bit of contextual background information on what you might see in a not so well-designed experience. Again, does not mean that it's not awesome functionality. Just some things that really should be reconsidered and maybe addressed. And with that, what defines a well-designed phone application? Again, I'm going to talk really at the high level here. These types of applications that are well-designed are useful, usable, and desirable. With respect, to, uh, with respect to useful, they solve a real user problem. In the case of the uh, meal nirvana that we just saw, it's solving a real user problem. Imagine being out with your friends. You are in a new area, and maybe you all decide that you want to go out to a restaurant. You don't know the restaurants in the, uh, that particular area. You could pull out your Meal Nirvana application on your Windows phone, and it could help you find a restaurant that you all might like. Clearly, really good and useful functionality. An application, and this really is an application that I'm aware of, that maybe you just simply enter a number into the interface, and it tells you whether you're right or wrong. Not very useful. Maybe not something that you would use more than once. Um, so uh, let's take a look at an image. This obviously is not an application, but it does represent the concept of useful. With respect to this image, this, this car is not useful. It's not solving a real user problem. It's not going to take me anywhere. In fact, it's causing more of a problem than it's solving by messing up my driveway or my parking lot. My parking lot. <laughs> um, so next, usable. Usable applications are performant, they load quickly, and they crash rarely. They're also very easy to intuit how to interact with these types of applications. You don't need a manual to figure out how they work. And the content that's presented in these applications is very meaningful and represented, representative of the content a user would expect in those interfaces. Again, not an application, but an image that will help demonstrate the opposite of usable. You know, you look at this and it's kind of cool looking, but how do you use it, right? Do you put your hands on the outside? If you're trying to, if you have hot tea or hot, hot coffee in here, clearly you don't want to do that because this is metal, it's going to burn you, so, but you don't want to put your hand on the handle either, right? It's going to, it's really a bad user experience. So you might wonder, well, where's the user manual for this thing? How do I actually use this thing? Not a good user experience. Um, with respect to desirable, Desirable qualities in an application experience really take that experience to the next level. It draws users in and makes them want to use this particular application. 
it can be an experience that's really new and novel. Um, it could also be an experience that, in the case of Windows Phone, fully leverages the hardware, for instance, taking advantage of the accelerometer or the GPS capabilities. With respect to Metro, excuse me, with respect to Windows Phone, design, uh, Windows Phone applications, these applications will also fully embrace the Metro design language and feel an overall part of the Windows Phone ecosystem. One last image. Again, the opposite of desirable. This is a home. Um, I don't know if this would sell very well. I don't like the overall aesthetic quality of this particular experience. Just, just one last image to kind of drive home the concept of desirable. And with that, let's move right into these best practices and spend a lot of time here. Um, I'm going to talk about 10 best practices really focused on the user experience. Many of them are totally going to align with what Arturo just talked about. And again, I'm going to use an application um, during the, the rest of this session where we're going to take it from a not so well designed state to a well designed state by applying these best practices. Let's take a look at the current state of our application. So it's a weather watch, it's called weather watch, and it's a weather application. And what it does is give you the five day forecast for your current location. It also provides alert information for your current location. Maybe there's a blizzard and you know a mountain pass would be really interesting to know that because maybe you needed to travel there for Christmas. Christmas isn't now, but it's getting close. It also offers images of the particular area that you're in. Let's take a deeper look at the experience. So it's uh, the information on the five-day forecast that we're seeing here. You know, it looks nice. You can actually interpret the information. It's giving you what you want. It doesn't, it's not really very powerful, though, and definitely not embracing um, topography. This information, this is the alerts information. Uh, it's, it's interesting, again, um, there's not a, alert, uh, not, of a lot of, not a lot of alert information displayed. You can click to see the full alert details and navigate to a new page. And that's something that we're going to address here in a moment. That's that opening animation running again. Again, there are images for the Seattle area. I'm pulling from Flickr, so they're random right now, um, which is interesting. And they, in this particular application, there's also the functionality of maybe you want to comment on an image um, to the, the owner of that image on Flickr. So that's the current state of our application. and. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first best practice. Embrace topography and use font weight and size to convey hierarchy in your interfaces. Core to the Metro design language and our native applications is a celebration of topography. And working hand in hand with that are the principles of authentically digital and content not Chrome. Most information displayed in any application is textual information. Why unnecessarily decorate that information with gradients and Chrome and maybe even unnecessary graphics. Why not celebrate topography to make that interface beautiful and even more meaningful? Um, that's not to say that you can't use graphics as we were kind of talking about during the break. They just need to be well thought out. So let's go into expression blend and I'm gonna show you how we can take our current application from a, um, a state where it's not celebrating topography to the extent that it can to a much better state. So I'm going to work quickly in Blend, and I'm going to go deeper and probably answer some of the questions you may have about how to actually work with Blend when I, when I do the build session. So just keep in mind that many of your questions may be answered there. Um, just briefly, this is uh, the main page. This is a panorama. And this is the content, the XAML content for that particular page. We're going to look at the weather five-day forecast information and the alerts information, these two panels right here. And I have a data template. Um, all of the information on these two panels is displayed in a list box that uses a data template to style the information. I have a data template that I've prepared that better celebrates topography. So to move quickly, I'm going to apply this new data template. So to do it, I right click on the list box and I'm going to go into the uh, item template, and I'm going to apply a resource. It's this local weather item template. Let me just undo that. So when I redo it, 
boom. I mean, instantly the information is very clear uh, and it's displayed entirely in use, through use of topography. Big and beautiful. Today I know it might be snowy. You know, tomorrow's overcast, cloudy, clear, very clear and bold and beautiful. And when I run the application, you'll see I have an additional aesthetic um, element that I'm adding where I'm coloring the text based on the temperature range. So you'll see that when I run the application here in a moment. It's done in the code behind to make the topography even more beautiful and more meaningful. So let's do the same thing to our alerts list box. Again, I'm right clicking on it, edit additional templates, going into the item template and applying a resource that I've already created, the alerts item template. And you'll see instantly more information is displayed. It's actually a little bit more usable in its current state. Still not where I want it to be. I'm gonna make it a little bit more beautiful by making two columns of textual information. And in this case, I'm gonna uh, change the items panel for this particular list box to a wrap panel, which will give me two columns of information. Again, I have a resource. Then I'm gonna leverage, and instantly, much more beautiful, more usable, and more meaningful. And let's run it. So we can see the text colorization of the weather information that I mentioned. So right now I'm pulling information from Seattle and it looks like uh, the only day where it's semi-warm is uh, next Tuesday. Um, but definitely celebrating topography quite a bit more and it's actually more usable and more meaningful. Oops. So the next best practice, and Arturo talked quite a bit about this in our native Windows Phone applications. We've used the grid that you're seeing here to guide layout of our interfaces. Use a grid system to guide layout of your interface elements as well. We have this grid made available for you. Definitely leverage it. Um, the principle of clear, light, open, and fast really applies to use of this grid. Organizing and grouping information nicely in your interfaces makes it a lot more aesthetically pleasing. Use of this grid can also make it easier to take advantage of negative space or that empty space, white space, not white in this case. Um, and the benefit of this negative space is it can really draw the user's eye to the information that's most important that they look at on that screen. It makes it more usable. So let's take a look at use of this grid in Expression Blend. So I have a grid, this grid that you can leverage as well, already in my project and it's collapsed and I'm simply gonna make it visible. I'm gonna duplicate it to make it a little bit bolder. So it's very bold. Let's go to our local weather information. And the information's not really chunked well together. It's not really like holding, holding together as a unit. And you'll also notice that the uh, information is not lining very nicely at left. So I have a data template that I'm going to apply to fix these issues. Again, the, it's an item template, excuse me. Right click, edit the item template. I'm gonna apply this local weather B item template. And if I undo that, you'll see the difference. So that's the previous um, user experience. And with the new item template, you'll see that things are grouped much better together and the alignment at left is much better as well. It feels better. And we're gonna do the same thing to our alerts information. Again, right click on the alert list box, apply this template that I've previously created, this alerts B item template. And if I undo that, and redo it again. Before, elements were not aligning nicely at left. They really weren't grouped together um, as coherently as they are now. It just feels better. It's a much better user experience. So I'm gonna save this and delete both of these grids because we're not gonna use them anymore. Let's go back and talk a little bit more about grids. Grids can not only improve the aesthetic quality of your experiences, 
but I kind of alluded to this previously, also the usability of your user experiences. So there's research that you can uh, find out on the internet. This is one example. It's research done by a man named Noam Tretinsky at Ben Gurion University on a very, very simple user interface. This is a bank teller interface, just with this you know, series of uh, numbers that you're seeing here, or keys that you're seeing here. The interface at left, nicely aligned to the grid. The interface at right, just two buttons are slightly askew. He ran users through a series of tests on both of these interfaces, and the interface at left tested far better. So not only can grids make your experiences, again, more aesthetically pleasing and beautiful, but they also can make them a lot more usable. Something as simple as just a little bit of misalignment can harm the usability of your experiences. So very important to keep in mind. And use of animations and transi transitions and effects to guide and delight your users. Definitely core to our native applications in the Metro design language. You're going to want to leverage these in your, your experiences as well. Um, what we're seeing here is the turnstile page transition animation. We're going to add a page, page transition animation to our experience. And the next thing that we're going to add is the tilt effect which we're going to use to alert users to the fact that when they press on something that tilts, it's going to navigate them to a new page where they see that nice page transition. I'm going to do this in blend. And so where you find, where you can leverage these page transitions is um, in our uh, Silverlight, our, not Silverlight, our Windows Phone Toolkit available on CodePlex. I'm sure many of you have used the toolkit. Raise your hand, have you used the toolkit? Oh, so not that many. So, okay, so this will be really interesting, but you can download it on CodePlex. It's the Windows Phone Toolkit, a series of animations and transitions, as well as many other useful controls are available in this toolkit, so definitely check it out. Um, what I would have to do, we're going to start by leveraging the page transition animations, and then we're going to do the tilt effect. Um, what I'd have to do is download and install the toolkit off of CodePlex, and then I would need to add a reference to the toolkit in my project. I've already done that. So let me just make this a bit bigger. So you can see, I've already done that because I used the wrap panel that you saw previously. The wrap panel is one of the many controls available in the toolkit. Very useful control. And then the next thing you would need to do for these page transitions is you would need to go into main uh, app.xaml.cs. So we'll do that. And you need to leverage the transition frame. It's the root frame for the application. Um, we use Windows, or it's the phone application frame. By default, the transition frame is what you want. I have it commented out down here. I'll just uncomment it. And this is the transition frame from the toolkit. And we'll comment out the phone application frame here. Save that. And then there is a series of XAML that you need to apply for each page transition in your various pages that are going to leverage that page transition, as well as you need to also reference that toolkit namespace. Um, and we're on main page uh, .xaml here. So because we're using the wrap panel, whoops, go back up to the top. Because we're using the wrap panel, we already have a reference to the toolkit namespace, as you see here, so I don't need to do that. I'm going to copy this for use in other pages, though. The next thing you need to do is add the specific XAML for the page transition. And I have a style that I've created, or actually a series of styles that I've created, and it's in a resource dictionary, um, this particular resource dictionary. Um, actually, it's not in that resource dictionary. Let me add the resource dictionary. Add an existing item. It is this resource dictionary here. And if I build my project, I'll have access to that resource dictionary. And so again, I have a series of styles for each page that utilize those page transitions. And I'm simply going to reference one of those styles by editing template for the page, apply resource. And I want this, I'm going to utilize this slide page uh, transition. So I'm going to utilize this slide page style. And we can look more deeply at these styles during the build session. I'm going to move quickly again. Um, then in each of the other pages, let's go ahead and do the same. 
I need to again add a reference to the toolkit namespace. I don't have it in the other pages. And then I'm going to want to reference the style for the slide page transition. Go to my image details page. Reference to the namespace. Edit the template. Apply the page style for slide page style. And then I have one more. Let's go to my pages. I have my alerts details. OK, I need my alerts details, details page. Again, add a reference to the namespace. And then reference the style by right-clicking on it, Edit Template, Apply Resource, Slide Page Style. OK, so I'm going to build it, and we'll see that it's a much better, more engaging user experience. So I've only applied the page transition styles. I'll do the tilt uh, style in just a moment. So we have the nice slide transition in effect, as simple as leveraging the transitions available in our toolkit. I have it on all of my pages. I click the back button. We see those nice transitions. It feels more cohesive with the overall Windows Phone applications. And it's just a much better experience overall, more engaging for users. Let's apply the tilt animation. Um, to our pages to make it a little bit more usable. So users know when they press on one of those items on that opening page that it's going to navigate them to a new page. So I want to do that in my alerts list box as well as my images list box. Let's start with our, my alerts list box. I, gotta do, I have to do this in XAML. And I can type this in. So I'm going to type tool, toolkit. Um, I want the tilt effect. I want is enabled true. Whoops, let's undo that. OK, try that one more time. So toolkit, again, I want the tilt effect is enabled. I'm going to set it to true. Then I'm going to copy and paste this down into my images list box. Here's my images list box. Just copy and paste it in place. And let's run it and take one last look before we move on. Oh, look, it's 6.02 AM. OK. So you see when I press on clear, no tilt effect, no page transition, no more details. When I go over to my alerts information, you see the nice tilt effect. I know that that tilt effect I quickly learned is going to take me to a new page. Again, that animation will be gone in a moment. We'll fix that issue. Same on the images. Just a little bit more usable and more engaging for users. Again, as easy as leveraging those animations available in our toolkit. It's more in line with our Windows Phone applications and third-party applications in general. So next, let's talk about designing with themes in mind and using these theme resources that are available for you um, to ensure that your applications can respond to theme settings that users might choose in their, app in the, in their phone experiences. Arturo talked about this. Again, users can customize the background color from a dark color to a light color. They can also choose an accent color. Users like it when their preferences are uh, like, uh, represented in ap the other app application experiences. There are cases, many cases in fact, where you're going to want to customize the colors in your experiences. Maybe you have a specific branding that you need to represent in your experiences thing to keep in mind is you're going to want to make sure that you hard code all colors because you can run into usability issues if you don't. If not, you're going to want to test for all of the various theme settings that users might choose. So again, let's go into Blend and take a look at both cases. So one of the great things about Blend, let's see, okay, 
is that you can actually test the various theme settings using this tool. You don't have to run the application to do it, so it's very nice. Um, so if we, let's go back up to the top. So right now we're on the dark theme. We can actually switch it over to the light theme and see the effect. We can change the accent color and see the effect. Uh, nothing's changing because I've hard-coded all of the colors in this particular instance. But if I go to the light theme, you'll see that I actually haven't hard-coded all colors. By going to the light theme, I instantly have a usability problem in my experience, not something you want. If you look at the alerts details page, you'll see that I have an even bigger problem. It looks as if nothing is there. I didn't hard code all of the colors as I thought, so simply I need to go into the resource dictionary that I've created for my application and make sure that I'm hard coding all of the colors. Again, Blend makes it easy to test these types of situations. I'm gonna change the layout route, which isn't bound to a color, so that it is actually bound Excuse me, let's see. I need to actually go here and make this a little bit bigger. So again, I want to bind that layout with background color to the background color that I've specified in my resource dictionary. And I'm going to do the same thing on mainpage.xaml where we had that other problem. <coughs> Don't want to do it at the item level. I want to do it at the layout root level. Choose my custom background color. So now I've hard-coded all of the colors across my experience, and it's usable. So I'm in, a good, I'm in a good state right now. But let's say that I've decided that I actually want to allow users to customize the experience and have it respond to their, you know, their specific theme setting choices. I want to respect their preferences. I can do that as well. There are these theme resources that you can leverage, um, and they're very easy to leverage using Blend. So I'll show you how to do that. For this, because I have a resource dictionary with all of my colors, I just simply need to go into that resource dictionary, choose color resources, and these are the system colors or the theme resources that you can leverage. For my foreground color, I'm gonna leverage the system resource for phone foreground color. When I do, uh, the information becomes unreadable, but we'll fix that in a moment. By choosing the phone color resource for the background color, and I'm just going to go through that and do that for all of my color resources that I've specified here. I have a subtle color used elsewhere in my experience. And then I also have an accent color. And so now I'm leveraging all of those colors. And when I go to the dark theme, you'll see that it's just everything nicely responds to all of the, the user preferences that one might choose in their application. So it's really a great experience. And those are available for you to leverage. Um, Next, I want to talk about the best practice of leveraging the full power of Panorama and Pivot. And Arturo talked quite a bit, a bit about this, so I'll move quickly. But these are two of the core application patterns available for use in your applications. They're used widely throughout our native applications and, of course, third-party applications. And it's important to know the pros and cons of each and when each should be used. This is Cocktail Flow. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's a really great application. And they use Panorama at the high level of the experience. And then they use Pivot deeper in the experience to allow users to navigate, for instance, through the ingredients, the uh, process of actually creating one of the drinks that you might want to in this particular application. So let's talk about Panorama first. Again, Panorama, as Arturo mentioned, is this expansive, immersive experience, really invites the user in, think magazine cover, entices users into the experience so they'll dig deeper. Um, you'll notice on this particular screenshot, you don't see the status bar or the system tray where you would find the battery information and the date and time information or the time information. That's by default. If you use our project templates, you'll see that that's what you get by default with the project templates and that's what we recommend. You'll also notice a minimized app bar. That's also what we re recommend for panoramas. Um, and you'll also, when you use the project templates, you'll notice that we don't, the uh, panorama doesn't respond to orientation changes. That's our recommendation as well, is to keep it like that. This experience really isn't optimized for landscape orientations. It's optimized for the portrait orientations. We also recommend, as Arturo said, no more than five panorama items so users don't get lost in the experience. Again, it's really to invite users in and get them excited and dig deeper. 
Another reason five items is important, no more than five items is important to consider, is it doesn't support virtualization. I think Arturo mentioned this as well. So that's what this graphic down at the bottom is representing. When you're on page zero, page one, two, negative one, and negative two are all in memory. So if you have a lot of XAML elements and controls and visuals in these, pivot pa uh, these panorama items, you could run into a performance problem, clearly something you don't want because it makes the user experience not a great user experience. So with Pivot, the other core application pattern, this is a really provides for a really focused experience. You'll find it in our Outlook. You'll also see it. This is the Golf application that Arturo showed earlier. Um, you'll notice that the status bar or system tray, as it's called in the XAML, um, is on by default at top. It is on by default if you use our project templates. We recommend that. You'll see the uh, standard application bar down at the bottom. Uh, we recommend no more than seven pivot items again so users don't get lost in your experiences pivot on the other hand is virtualized so if you are on page zero page one and negative one are in memory page two and negative two are not in memory so it could be a little bit more performant uh, an experience for users so something you definitely want to consider when creating your applications Uh, so, okay, moving on to the next best practice. Again, I want to talk quickly about that. Um, it's, it's important to consider utilizing auto-sized interface elements because oftentimes your experiences are going to support multiple orientations, uh, uh, portrait and landscape, and you want to make sure that your interface is responding accordingly. Hard coding elements is definitely a potential problem. And we could just take a look at a, a quick example in our current application experience. So right now, you'll see when I go dig deeper and look at the full image, uh, it's filling all of the available space. Great experience. You'll find that when I rotate it to landscape, I'm not utilizing all of the space. It could be a better experience by utilizing all of the space. So to fix this problem, it's as simple as going into, we're going to do this in blend. This is in my image details page. It's as simple as going into the scroll viewer. Of course, I know where the problem is, so I'm moving quickly. And if you look at the width and the height information over there, I've hard coded the width and the height. Really unnecessary if I'm auto sizing when the orientation changes, whether it's portrait or landscape, the scroll viewer is going to fill up the entire space. So. That's exactly what I'm going to do and uh, something that you're wanna, going to want to consider in your experiences. So when we build, we'll see it's much better. So switch to landscape. We're filling all of the available space. It was as easy as that. And you can do this with a good majority of your controls. You can also use grids if you want to align information, maybe in columns or rows. And those can be auto-sized as well to fill all of the available space. So definitely, it's an important consideration. Turn this back. And the next best practice, I always think this looks funny. Um, remember back means back, not forward, not sideways, but back. So this is something that we've seen, like some problems in applications that people have been putting on, onto the marketplace. So important to mention, in Windows Phone, back does two things. It dismisses transient UI, such as alerts, notifications. Um, it also takes the user back to the previous page that they were on. It does not navigate them to some new random page. And it also does not drastically change the content on the current page that they're on. As Arturo mentioned, <clears throat> um, we use a hub and sco spoke, scope, <laughs> spoke navigation model. You start on the start page. You open your application, go to page one, page two, page three, hit back. It goes to two, one, back to the start of your application, back again. You go back to the start, start page. Consistent and predictable. And we recommend that you follow our model. An example of our model would be our people experience. This is the people tile that I've pinned to my start, uh, my start page. 
if I click on that tile, I navigate into people. Let's say that I pan over to what's new or pan this way to what's new, because that's what I would do. Um, and drill into maybe one of the comments that have been posted on Facebook. Look at Carl's information. Then I click back. I go back to the what's new page. I click back. I go back to the start page. I don't actually go back to that previous page because it's a panorama. So I actually go back to the start page. Just wanted to call that out real quickly. In Mango, you can leverage these new deep link tiles where, and I'll show you in a moment, you can actually pin to an experience deeper within your application. Um, if you look at our People Hub, we have an example of that. So let's say in the People Hub that you wanted to deep link to this person in red here and add a deep link tile to the start page. You could do that. So I'm, I'm pinning this particular contact to the start page. That contact is on the start page. I click on that contact. I go straight to that specific contact's information. And there are a series of tasks or actions that I can take once I'm in this contact's inf information. I can edit this person. I could look at their profile information, call them, text them. I could also look at the history of our conversations, maybe even drill in to a specific conversation. When I click back, I go back to history. When I click back again, I go back to the start page. When I click back again, I would go back to the people page. Back performs consistently, acts consistently in our user experiences. And again, we recommend that you follow our model. Um, and again, in Mango, you can leverage these deep link tiles. Let's say maybe you have a shopping application experience with a wish list or a shopping cart. You may want to allow users to deep link to that wish list or that shopping cart to make for a better user experience. Maybe they'll even make more purchases you know, by looking at that wish list consistently. Um, so it might be great for you as well. Um, you may ask yourself as a creator of this application, well, what if somebody deep links into this application using this, this particular tile? They're going to possibly want to go elsewhere in the application experience, which is great. You can definitely do that, as you saw with the contact. You were able to go to other areas of the contact information. But when the user clicks back, it's important that they were ac they're actually taken back to the previous screen. OK, now that I've said that, in, uh, <clears throat> in Mango, you can modify the back stack. And it actually might make sense and make for a better user experience. So it is imp important to consider. Um, so take, for instance, that wish list scenario that we were talking about. I have this shopping application, and I allow users to create a deep link tile to that wish list. They click on, the, click on that you know, deep link tile on the start page, go straight to the wish, wish list. They decide they want to finally purchase that thing they've been coveting. They go to the billing information by clicking buy. They click next after filling in all of the billing information. They're taken to the credit information. They click next. They've made their purchase. When they click back, it's actually a better experience in many cases if they're taken directly to the wish list. The reason is, is this information here is really not meaningful anymore. So it might make sense to actually modify the back stack. So it's something definitely to consider. And I have a few other examples. You can take a look at the slide deck later. I'm going to skip over them just, in, just because of concern about time. And let's talk about ensuring transient interface elements don't appear in the back stack. If you recall, in the weather application, every time I went deeper into the application and clicked back, you saw that opening animation run again. Um, one example of transient interface elements interfering with the back stack. Another case where that might happen is, let's say that you have login UI in your interface. When for users first um, experience your interface, they may have to log in. You want to make sure that that login information doesn't appear again when users drill deeper into the experience and click the back button. And there are several ways that you can take it, uh, remove that problem. One is to wrap that information in a pop-up and then hide the pop-up after they actually navigate deeper into the application. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quickly in Visual Studio this time. Make sure that I've saved this. And we'll go to Visual Studio, reload our application. and. Collapse a few things here so we can 
dig into the area that's problematic, um, which is down at the bottom in this grid here. There's a lot of stuff. I'll just collapse it. This is where that animation is, uh, is existing, is in this particular grid right here. As mentioned, if I wrap it in a pop-up, it'll allow me to hide that pop-up. I'm going to use a snippet to move quicker. It'll allow me to hide that pop-up after that animation's run the first time. As you'll see, it's gonna make for a much better user experience. So what I'm gonna do, let's just quickly go into the code behind for mainpage.xaml. And I'm gonna scroll down to where that animation is taking, is actually launched. It's actually in, I've overridden, if I could find it, I've overridden on Navigated 2 in uh, my application, and that's where I'm calling this opening animation. And then I also have an event handler that I've created for when the animation completes. So this is definitely what you'll want to do in this particular scenario. And then I've, that pop-up is called pup, so I just have to set is open to false. And if we run it, I'm going to go ahead and run it from Expression Blend. If we run it, You'll see that it was as simple as that to remove that interfering opening animation, the transient UI that we don't want to see when we're pressing the back button. Again, you might encounter this also if you have login UI, and there are other scenarios that I can't think of right now, um, but you'll definitely want to pay attention to this. Oh, I don't know what happened there. So I drill deeper, go to one of some of my alert details information, and when I click back, you no longer see that opening animation happening, happening again. It's just a much better user experience. So the next best practice is you want to ensure your application state is persisted appropriately. And this is going to depend on your scenarios. So has anybody in this room used WhatsApp? OK, a few of you. It's like a chat application. So that's, that's the example that we're going to look at here. So when you open this application, It'll open to your chats. And let's say that I want to have a conversation with Arturo. Um, let's say I would click on Arturo there. I see all the previous chats that we've had, and I would click on that uh, gray text box down at the bottom. Let's say I type my message, and I decide I want to send an image. I would click on the little paper clip that you see here. It would take me to the page where I could choose the image that I want to attach. Let's say that I changed my mind. I no longer want to send them an image. I go back to the previous page. That text that I had entered previously is still there. In this particular scenario, that's what I expect. So I would expect that um, the system automatically persists that information for me. And it can be in, um, uh, why is it eluding me? Uh, can't think of the name. We have a, a local data store that you can leverage. I'll think of the name in a minute. It's totally eluding me right now. But it's important to persist information in certain scenarios. And in this particular scenario, the user is going to expect that you persist the text that they had entered previously. Let's say that I decide I don't want to send Arturo text at all. So I go back again, and then I change my mind. Believe me, I've done this. I want to go back, and uh, I do decide I want to send him a text. In this particular scenario, even if I did it all like right one after another, that textual information is gone. And the creator of this application made the appropriate assumption. It's more than likely the case that the user is going to want to start the text over from scratch. So you need to think about your scenarios and persist the information accordingly. With regard to persistence, it's important to understand the application lifecycle. So this is the application lifecycle model in Mango before. Tombstone would be here, and dormant wouldn't be there. Uh, so let's, let's just talk about an example. So I'm running up WhatsApp, and let's say I open Facebook. WhatsApp is going to go from the running state to the deactivated state to the dormant state. And let's say that I decide to go back to WhatsApp. It's going to immediately go from, uh, from dormant to activated to running. And what you'll see different between Mango and previous versions is you will no longer see that resuming dot, dot, dot uh, experience. The application will immediately rehydrate, making for a much better experience, because we can have multiple applications in memory at once. And the system does all that for you. It, prior to Mango, again, everything was tombstoned. 
In Mango, applications can still be tombstoned if too much memory is taken. So you still may need to handle tombstoning if there is a scenario where you need to persist data for your users. And that's done in the app.xaml.cs application activated and deactivated methods. In, man in Mango, you're going to want to you're going to want to consider things a little bit differently. So you can actually test in this is the application activated method kind of stubbed out here. You're actually going to want to test for whether the application is dormant. So e dot is application instant preserved. If that's true, it's dormant. Um, in that case, you're not going to want to restore state. Again, we're going to do it automatically for you, and it's going to be a much better experience because you're not going to see that resuming. It's going to instantly rehydrate. If it was tombstoned, it wasn't dormant, you're going to want to restore the state. So you're going to want to test for that in, man in Mango. It's really important to make for a better user experience. So the last thing. So, and Arturo talked about this quite a bit, live tiles, absolutely amazing feature. You're going to want to take advantage of it. Think about, like, there are tons of interesting ways you can make live tiles really draw your users in. In our weather application, let's take a look at our live tile. Go to the start screen. And if we watch it for a while, imagine many other applications on here. I'm kind of scanning them. Our weather watch application isn't doing anything. Wouldn't it be nice if our weather watch application actually showed today's weather information? It'd make for a much better user experience because I could be kind of glancing at my start page, maybe intending to interact with a different application, but I can instantly get glance and go and understand what the weather is going to be like today. Great experience and can make people really happy about using your application. So let's take a look at one way that you might actually leverage live tiles and in particular in our weather application. I'm going to do this in Visual Studio, not Blend. And so right here, and I'm going to do this in code. You're going to have to do this in code as well. Um, so right here, this local weather data ready method is where I'm basically getting the data returned for um, the five day forecast and binding it to my list box. Um, and this is where I can also grab the weather information for today's weather. And so that's where I'm going to grab that information. I'm also going to add a new method. And we'll talk about this new method that I'm going to add here in just one moment. But let me drop it in place. <coughs> the new method is in place. And below where I'm binding to the list box, the weather information, I'm going to call that update tile method that I just added. So I'm calling it right here. And I'm passing in, oops, passing in the weather details. Oops, OK, I'm not going to do that anymore. The weather information for today, as well as the temperature for today. And if we go down to that method, you'll see that in this method, I'm taking the weather description information for today, as well as the temperature for today. I'm basically looking for the start page tile here. If I, find, if I find it, I move on. If I don't find it, I'm just going to return. If I do find it, though, I'm going to uh, create the tile data. Um, and I'm going to make the back title for that tile data, Seattle. I've, in this particular application, I've hard-coded everything. I'm not actually using lo you know, the GPS information, so sorry about that. So that's why I'm hard-coding it. Um, you might do something different. The back content is weather is and that description information that I passed in, as well as the temperature. So if I run this, you'll see that we have an error because, I'm, because I didn't change this up here. Um, so I was actually launching to the device from Visual Studio. That's why I'm running the error. I don't have the device connected, so I simply need to launch to the emulator. Now let's try that one more time. It's deploying. It's taking a while. OK. So our application launches. In this particular scenario, I'm writing the tile data, the start page tile data, after the application is run. So now that it's run, if we go back to the start page, 
Again, imagine you're looking at other applications, you know, just pulled up the, you know, like uh, open the start page. You can instantly glance and see, wow, it's 38 in Seattle, um, which is cold for Seattle. Clearly not here. I think it's warmer than normal here. But it's great to be able to glance and go to get interesting information off of the start page. And you can do this with live tiles, so you'll definitely want to leverage them. You'll probably want to take, consider taking your scenarios a little bit further than this example that I showed you. You can leverage background agents to do that, to have code run in the background. So maybe every 30 minutes, I wanted to grab the latest weather information. I could do that using background agents and constantly update that tile. So you want to look into that a little bit more. Um, and with that, those are the 10 best practices. Any questions before we move on? Five minutes? We have five minutes for questions. Oh, till break. Oh, for break. Oh, we only have five minutes for break. I went over. OK. Break or questions? <laughs> All right, break. All right, thanks.